Well, uh, I see people are uh, coming into the attendee room, and uh, I want to wish everyone a welcome on this. Uh, it's a beautiful fall day here in Indianapolis. I know we have people joining us from all over the country. Uh, what I will do as uh, people continue to join is I will open us up in a word of prayer. So if you'd like to join me in that. Gracious God, we give you thanks that in this season where congregations and pastors and Christian leaders are called to be as faithful and creative as ever, we give you thanks that there are congregations and pastors who know to seek renewal, to seek respite, to seek rest, and to seek revitalization. We give you thanks for the ministry of all of your people across time and space. And we ask that you bless this time together as we seek to discern together your call on our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, it's really a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, informational webinar on the Lilly Endowment Clergy Renewal Programs. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Rob Saylor, and for the past nine years, I've been pleased to direct these programs here at Christian Theological Seminary, where we administer these programs on behalf of the Lilly Endowment. Uh, throughout the webinar, you'll also be hearing from the Reverend Callie Smith, who is the Associate Director of the programs, as well as the Reverend Brian Williams from the Lilly Endowment. So in fact, what I'd like to do is to um, go ahead and give the floor to uh, Reverend Williams to bring greetings from the Lilly Endowment. Well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Lilly Endowment, um, we uh, are grateful for your uh, presence today and for your interest in the Clergy Renewal Program. Uh, I, I don't want to be before you long, but want to extend a welcome and just give you a little bit of a context around uh, why Lilly Endowment has done this clergy renewal program for so long. Um, um, you may know that for more than two decades, the endowment has really invested in the cultivation and care of clergy and their congregations through this renewal program. And since 2012, uh, it has uh, been uh, housed really in our trusted partner, uh, CTS, Christian Theological Seminary, to facilitate the program. But, but just to say a word about why the endowment has invested for over two decades. Uh, first of all, the endowment cares about pastors. Um, uh, back in the, in the 90s, our chairman uh, of, the, of the board had recognized that there was little being done to help clergy actually flourish in ministry. And so he challenged the religion division um, to develop an initiative that would address the critical need that pastors face all the time. And, and after much research and many conversations, the endowment launched in 1999, uh, the Clergy Renewal Program in Indiana, and then in 2000, made it a national program as well. And for many of the participants, it was the first time that they were invited to seriously tap into their imagination and plan what it looks like to step away from the daily demands of, of, of life in ministry of church life through a structured period of really Sabbath rest and, and what we call renewal. But what this research taught us uh, mainly was no surprise to you all, a pastor's life regardless of how rewarding it can be, it's exhausting. And you all know pastors are constantly pivoting from one thing to the next, from the hospital to the church council meeting, to Bible study prep, to sermon prep. Um, Dr. Matt Bloom at the University of Notre Dame uh, in their Mendoza College of Business uh, uh, for over a decade has uh, tracked research and done research uh, on the pastoral vocation, if you will. And, and he concluded that being a pastor is a tough demanding job, one that is not always very well understood or appreciated. Therefore, the congregation plays a vital role in a pastor's well-being. And if you compound that observation before the pandemic with the pandemic, 
we are hearing even more around the country how absolutely exhausted pastors are. Um, you know, pivoting uh, to online ministry uh, brought up an array of challenges that churches had to problem solve and overcome. And, and what was thought at the time to be a short term sort of a solution uh, ended up becoming a marathon, uh, ended up going from a sprint to uh, a really a triathlon. And so uh, really where we settle on this is that we ultimately recognize renewal is vital to the well-being of pastors and congregations in their community. And it, it enhances our vitality, if you will, to do God's work in the world. Um, I will leave you with this one last illustration from, from Dr. Matt Bloom. He talks about ministry uh, in a setting of being a, uh, on a stage, like a theater stage. Um, when he talks about ministry, he says, pastors are good at being on the front stage where the performance happens. Pastors are, are good at being up front because that is what they're expected to do quite a bit. And he said, pastors are even also equally good at working with the backstage because backstage is what happens, all the prep work, all of the things that have to go right for the front stage to happen. But then he says, pastors are not very good with being off stage. So where is the place that you step away from the performance to attend to all the critical aspects of your life? It is off stage. And when do you pastors really get a chance to do that? So I'm grateful for all of you all being here today. And on behalf, again, of Lily Endowment, we, are, we, we thank you. And we wish you well and, and really caring for yourselves, caring for your congregations. God bless you. Thank you so much, Brian. And uh, thank you for those words. And we at Christian Theological Seminary remain very grateful to Lily Endowment for entrusting us with this work, of, with this ministry, really. Um, I think I speak for both Callie and I when I say we really approach this as ministry and as a way of supporting the church in the world. So in a few minutes, I'm just going to say a little bit more about the clergy renewal programs themselves. But in the meantime, let me just go through a couple of logistical matters for our time together this afternoon. You see, I believe at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A box. That is a place where you are welcome to ask any questions that you like. The, um, the question that you ask will go directly to um, Callie and myself. I don't believe they'll be seen by anyone else on the webinar, but um, especially when we move into the latter half of our time today, we'll be checking that box and trying to answer as many questions as we can. You'll notice that the chat feature is uh, not active for those of you attending the webinar. So if you have a question, just go ahead and throw it into the Q&A. So before we get too much further into details, what are the Lilly Endowment Clergy Renewal Programs? What is it that these programs do and what are they for? Uh, quite simply put, what we do in the Lilly Endowment Clergy Renewal Programs is that we give grants to congregations of up to $50,000 to support the pastor taking a leave in order for, to pursue activities that are renewing for that pastor. Meanwhile, up to $15,000 of that $50,000 may be used by the congregation for, for, say, covering costs while the pastor is away in hopes that pursuing this opportunity will not um, cost the congregation anything monetarily. Uh, congregations can also pursue some of their own renewal activities, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But again, the essence of the programs are, is quite simple. We give grants to congregations up to $50,000 to support the pastor taking a renewal leave. Now I'll say in a few minutes, some of the changes that we've made, but let me just sig signal one now. Uh, if you, if we had been doing this presentation two years ago, I would have said that the expectation is that the pastor take that time away in one uninterrupted chunk, generally about three, anywhere from three months to four or six months. 
Recently, we've made the change to where we are allowing pastors and congregations to propose to us how they would like to break that time up. If uh, the best way to achieve the renewal goals is for the pastor to be away for an uninterrupted uh, three months, four months, six months, then absolutely that is what you should do. And that's what you should make the case for. If, however, circumstances are such to where the renewal goals and life goals would best be met by, say, doing a month at one portion, a month and a half later on, as long as it generally adds up to around three months at a minimum across a 24 month period, then uh, then that is okay with us and you're welcome to make the case for that. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, but I just want to put on the radar that when we talk about the pastor stepping away from obligations in the parish, that can either be for one extended period or for a shorter amount of time. What sorts of things do pastors do when they step away? Well, you tell us. It's uh, Callie, I wonder, do you have examples that uh, stick out in your mind of things that pastors have done that um, they found particularly renewing? Um, I'm, I'm always fascinated to see pastors proposing to reconnect with um, aspects of their past. I mean, we see people who are proposing to go do genealogical research and actually visit some of those geographies where they will do that. Um, we see people uh, proposing to take time to reconnect with one of their artistic passions. We've had people spending the uh, leave time pursuing photography or um, writing or illuminating sacred manuscripts. Um, it's really been fascinating dance, um, visual art. Um, there are all sorts of possibilities, but also people pursuing um, specific topics and interests in ministry as well in certain areas of passion. So, I mean, that's just a, a glimpse and a snapshot, but it, it really is a a wide open area of possibility. Um, what have been some of your favorites, Dr. Saylor? Well, I think about pastors who, as you say, have reconnected with elements of their past, but who have also found things that just really fuel their enthusiasm for preaching, their enthusiasm for proclaiming God's word. Um, and oftentimes that takes the form of traveling to um, contexts that may be very unfamiliar to them. So we have pastors that travel to Africa, to Asia, to the Holy Land, um, places that um, speak to their souls, but also um, inspire them. I'm also very intrigued by pastors who discern uh, something in their community um, that it is very worthy of long extended meditation. But that's the kind of long extended time that it's hard to find in the day to day obligations of the parish. So, for instance, I think of pastors who are aware of the fact that their congregations are in food deserts, who want to um, spend some time thinking and researching the nature of food deserts and be not simply to have the information, but also to be spiritually formed, to be inspired for leadership in the congregation when they return. My um, my absolute favorite instance of a clergy renewal leave, and I don't know, maybe this person is listening, but uh, my absolute favorite was, I believe it was a priest who was going to go away and do three things. One, he was very interested in questions of succession. Uh, I believe this was an Eastern Orthodox priest. So he was interested in questions of succession in the parish. So he was going to spend some of his three month period going to monasteries and uh, not only praying and renewing himself spiritually, but also talking to the abbots saying, how does succession work in a monastery? And then the second thing he was going to do is he had a real passion for antique book binding. And one of the things with these grants is that up to 10% of the pastor's budget can be used to purchase supplies. Uh, you know, if, it's, if there's a passion for photography or a passion for art, uh, camera, art supplies, those sorts of things can be purchased with this grant money. So he used some of the grant money to purchase leather and various bookbinding supplies. And then my favorite thing was he said it was a lifelong dream to get his personal pilot's license. And, uh, and one of the activities for when he and the congregation came back together would be um, 
him taking car in a congregational picnic, taking people up in the plane. And I love that example because it shows that when you think about activities that are going to be renewing, both for the pastor and the congregation, it doesn't have to be just one thing, nor does it all have to tightly relate to one theme. If you have a general theme for it, that's fine, and you're welcome to write your application that way. But you can also just choose a variety of activities, and as long as they hold together in your mind and soul, both those of you who are pastors and congregations, then uh, chances are that's going to be an excellent application. What I hope you're hearing is that when you ask what are the best activities to propose, there is no one right model. And what is an excellent renewal leave for one pastor and one congregation in one context may not be the right activities at all for another and vice versa. So our tagline for the programs is what will make your heart sing. And I invite you to take that question seriously. And in fact, what I often invite people to do, those who are pastors, is to ask yourself this question. If at some future point in time, three months from now, six months from now, several years from now, you were to walk into your congregation, into your office, into the sanctuary, wherever, if you were to walk in and just feel on fire, inspired, but also rested, energized, ready to um, go after ministry, what would you personally, not what would your neighbor do, not, not, what, would your, um, not what would your peers do, what would you personally do that would get you to that state? And if you think in those terms, then that will not only get you closer to the question of what will make your heart sing, but chances are you and your congregation will be able to craft your application out of that passion, out of that fulfillment. And that's one of the things that makes for the strongest applications. Um, I want to say in relation to this, that um, even though we do give out a high number of grants every year, in fact, it's... Um, we give out almost seven and a half million dollars in a given year. These are competitive programs, and we do receive many more excellent applications than we're able to fund. And I say that both um, as a piece of reality and also as an encouragement saying when your congregation is discerning whether or not to apply for this, think about it in terms of the long game. Think about crafting over time an application that uh, truly speaks to you. It may be that it's funded on the first time. It may take several tries. Again, it's competitive, but um, do not be discouraged, especially if there are people listening or watching who have applied and haven't received the application or, or haven't received a grant. Just know that that's very common. I mentioned earlier that we had made some changes to the programs, and I mentioned one already, which is that instead of requiring that the pastor's leave be taken all in one chunk, pastors are now able to propose uh, a series of shorter leaves across a 24-month period if that is the most advantageous for their situation. Another change, and I believe this question has already come up in the chat, is that it used to be that in the national program, and I'll say a little bit more about the difference between the national and the Indiana programs in a minute. It used to be that in the national program, it was required that the pastor hold a master of divinity from a seminary accredited by the Association of Theological Schools. Now it's the case that we are allowing pastors to demonstrate their commitment to ongoing training, to ongoing learning through a variety of means, one of which might be the Master of Divinity, but it is no longer required that the Master of Divinity be the um, way in which that's demonstrated. So long story short, whereas it used to be um, the case that those applying in the national program had to have the Master of Divinity degree, now we're allowing you to demonstrate your commitment to ongoing formation through a variety of means. I've alluded to the Indiana and the national programs, and that's because we, in fact, do have two different programs that we administer here at CTS. One is the program specifically for Indiana congregations. The other is for the churches in the other 49 states, as well as Puerto Rico. 
one of the beauties of being able to do this information session online is that I'm aware we have people joining from all over the country. So if you're in Indiana, be sure to apply in the Indiana program. If you're anywhere else, your application is the national program. So Callie, having said that, people might be wondering, well, how do I apply? <laughs> I can speak to that question. Uh, we've we've tried to simplify uh, the submission methods this year. Um, and by that, I mean, you can submit your application packet in two different ways. Uh, you can either apply by mailing in a hard copy packet, or you can apply by uh, putting that packet into PDF form and emailing us. Um, but either way you decide to submit your application, uh, the request for proposals document that you'll find on our website really is going to be your one-stop shop guidebook for how to apply. Uh, so when you go to our website, you'll look for, if your congregation is in Indiana, look for the request for proposals document uh, for Indiana congregations. And if you're in any of the other states or DC or Puerto Rico, uh, then you'll want to look for the uh, national program request for proposals document. Uh, that document, it has, it describes everything you need to know. There are uh, fillable pages in, the, or there are pages in the back. We also have a fillable version if you wanna actually type directly into the PDF. Um, you'll have those forms that you'll fill out. The request for proposals will describe the different essays or proposal narratives that you'll need to write and add to the packet. Uh, and it will also describe a few other documents that you'll need to include in the packet to have a complete application. Uh, but then it, it, will, it will give you some addresses. There's a, a mailing address if you want to send the hard copy application packet in via United States Postal Service or there will be an email address uh, where if you want to take that same packet and put it into one PDF file, and then you can email that PDF file to us as an attachment. Um, now the, the RFP or the request for proposals will describe the time frame during which you can expect to receive a confirmation email, because it'll be different depending on which way you apply, but either way, please know that you should expect a confirmation email from us. And if you don't receive that confirmation email during the time frame that the RFP describes, then please do follow up with us. Uh, you can email us at that same email address in the RFP and just ask us to confirm receipt of the package because uh, we know you're putting a lot of time into this process and we wanna make sure that your application gets into consideration. Um, See, so also, I know we've had people ask us before, do you need to receive anything prior to the application? Like, do we need to receive a letter of inquiry or do we need to know that you're going to apply? And uh, the answer is no, you do not need to give us anything prior to submitting the application packet. Uh, now you're welcome to reach out to us beforehand, either by email or by phone, and we're happy to interact with you about the application process, but that's not a requirement. You, you can just send in your application packet. Um, the other thing that I do want to mention real quick is time frame. So the, the application deadline for this cycle is April 27th, 2022. Uh, for the, the hard copy mailed applications, that's a postmark deadline of April 27th, 2022. And if you're emailing your application packet as a PDF, then that's a 3 p.m. Eastern time uh, email deadline for April 27th of 2022. And uh, you're, you're welcome to send in your application packet any earlier than that. You're definitely welcome to submit early, uh, but that will not speed up the decision-making process. So regardless of how early you submit your application, uh, please know that all applicants will receive news of the award decisions by the end of August. So that won't, that time frame won't change if you submit earlier. Um, those are the basics as far as submitting your application. Now, you may have plenty of questions about what I've said, so feel free to enter any of those questions into the Q&A section, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can during this session. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand things back to Dr. Saylor. 
Well, and one question that's already come up in the chat that I think is related to the time frame piece, Callie, is it really does require that you think ahead a little bit. So um, as Callie mentioned, applications that are due this coming spring, that will be for a leave taken any time in the calendar year 2023. So in a way, you really do need to think about a year ahead. Uh, you the way to think about it again is to submit in the spring the year before or at least the spring before yeah. the January in which you would want to be eligible to start taking leave activities isn't that right Kelly that's right and you you had already mentioned that there was a, a 24 month time period in which to implement the program 2023 and 2024 um, but but we're definitely looking at the pastor's leave time at least beginning during 2023 for this. And I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Some people are saying, well, what if, um, what about a seven week sabbatical? What about a shorter length of time across that time than three months? And the answer to that question is that it's unlikely that an application that proposes less than three months cumulatively is going to be approved. And that is based on our experience in the um, close to 20 years now in which these programs have been offered, that it really does take the pastor a significant amount of time. If it's going to be truly sabbatical rest, truly renewal rest, it does take the pastor a, a, a significant amount of time to enter into that space fully. So even if it's not the case that a leave, it, that a three to four month leave can be taken continuously, we do look for congregations that can really um, show that they want to give that time to pastors, even if it has to be split up across that 24 month period. So I would urge you to think in terms of a minimum of three months during that time. Uh, because again, that's really what readers are going to gravitate towards the most. I should say just a little bit about our um, reading process. Much of it is fairly transparent. When your application is received, it will be read by multiple individuals. And these are individuals that know the programs well, that know congregational ministry well, and to a person deeply love pastors and love congregations and um, what will they be looking for they'll be looking for first that the application checks all the boxes in terms of requirements and so on but then beyond that what are they looking for they're asking the question is the application making the case that this is the right time in the life of the parish and in the life of the pastor to pursue this opportunity? And are these the right activities that will get the pastor there? I, I mentioned that one of the worst things you can do is to sort of copy someone else's <laughs> renewal strategy thinking, oh, well, if they got funded, I will too. Well, if, if somebody else got funded, it's because they made the case that for that particular pastor at that particular parish at that particular time, these were the right activities and this is the right time frame. And so again, what you wanna do is to find that for yourself. And the readers will really um, be looking for that, um, uh, that beautiful uh, coming together of all of those different factors in a quality application. Um, another major thing that readers will be looking for is congregational enthusiasm and support for the application. There are a number of places on the application itself, if you have a chance to take a look at it, uh, where the congregation indicates not only its support, but its enthusiasm, its excitement for this possibility, both for the pastor and for itself. There will be places where a congregational representative will write, sort of speaking for the congregation. There's another very important question that describes the process by which the congregation decides to make an application. Now, we're aware that their congregations have all sorts of different ways of going about decisions like that, and it matters um, what branch of the Christian tradition you're in, it matters what size your congregation is in. All of those things can be variable, but what the application must do is show that whatever process has been followed, it has secured a high level of congregational enthusiasm and buy-in for this process. So right activities at the right time with a high level of congregational enthusiasm, 
those are some of the key factors that make for a very high quality application. I'm, I'm seeing a number of questions that's uh, really, uh, I'm glad they're being asked because they have to do with this question of bivocational pastors. Um, I've a number of the changes that I've mentioned, such as allowing for a more flexible structure to um, believe um, and several other changes that we've made really have been one way of showing what we've long said, which is that we have a deep love and respect for bivocational pastors in these programs. If you are a bivocational pastor or a congregation being served by a pastor with multiple jobs, we warmly encourage you to apply. And we invite you to think about these funds in whatever way you need to think about them in order to make this leave possible. It is not required that if you're a pastor with a second job that during your leave time you take a leave from that second job. We realize that that's not realistic for pastors. If, however, um, your leave activities means that you will be losing income, say it's more of a contract work or a gigging type situation, then you are in fact welcome to designate a portion of the funds as an offset to that lost income. Similarly, if you are traveling on your leave with loved ones, which we, which most people do, and we love to see that. And if your, say your partner is going to lose money by taking some time away, you're welcome to designate a portion of these funds to offset that. And let me just take that and expand it out even further. Everyone's life is different. Everyone's life circumstances are different. So whatever you need this money to do in order for you to pursue the activities that you want to pursue, think expansively about that. So we have folks that use this money to bring along childcare if they're traveling abroad with very young children. We have folks using this money for pet care, for house sitting, um, whatever you need funds for in order to pursue these activities, uh, think expansively about that. And if you have any questions as to whether a given expenditure is going to be appropriate or not, feel free to reach out to us. I'll say now and I'll say throughout the rest of the broadcast, any, any questions you have, uh, we are standing by to answer, and you can email um, clergyrenewal at cts.edu. That's the right address, isn't it, Cali? Clergyrenewal at cts.edu uh, with your questions. So, Cali, have you noticed uh, other questions in the Q&A? Yes, I, well, I've noticed one, um, the, and relevant to the, the question of budget. Um, can, the, of the $50,000, up to $15,000 of that can be the congregation's expenses budget. Um, can that be used to pay the pastor's salary while the pastor's away? Now, the answer to that is actually no. So part of uh, applying to this program involves the congregation agreeing to uh, continue the pastor's full salary and benefits uh, during that leave time. However, that, that up to $15,000 for the congregation's expenses budget uh, means that the congregation can use that funding to secure um, whatever sort of leadership coverage or um, preaching or pastoral care or what other kinds of uh, uh, coverage they would need to help with while the pastor is away. Uh, so hopefully that division makes sense. And that does raise the question, are there any no-no activities for congregations? Are there any things that the money cannot be used for other than paying for a pastoral salary and so on? I would suggest two broad categories that you want to stay away from when it comes to congregational activities. One is what we might refer to as long-term capital improvements to the congregation's property. In other words, if the, if the parish needs a roof fixed, this is not the money to use for that. Um, if the parish wants to upgrade its sound system or its computer system, it's a fine thing to do, but that's not really what these grant funds are for. So if you're thinking about, about congregational expenses, don't do anything that's going to be a capital upgrade to the congregation's property. 
The other broad category I would give a caution about when it comes to congregational activities would be as follows. You are welcome and in fact encouraged to bring in guest speakers, guest workshop facilitators. And the best ones that we've seen have been on things that really deepen the congregation's spiritual and missional life. So on topics like Bible study, theology, spirituality, prayer, uh, those sorts of things. However, be very cautious about bringing in anyone who's going to start conversations that are best had while the pastor and the congregation are together. Uh, in other words, this is probably not the time to bring in a consultant to talk about payroll or to talk about uh, worship styles or to talk about any of those other topics, which are things that congregations need to talk about, but you probably want to talk about it when the pastor and the congregation are together. Um, and I say that because one of the things you'll do in the application is you'll say, um, what it is that the congregation is going to do if they're bringing in a guest speaker, why this guest speaker, what, what are they going to talk about? And if the readers see that it's a, a situation in which the guest speaker or workshop leader may start conversations that are best had while the pastor is present, that's going to be a red flag. So those two broad categories, long-term capital improvements and congregations that should really be had when the pastor and congregation are together, those are two things to avoid with congregational activities, as well as anything that will pay the pastor's salary. Yeah. Just looking through the chat, really appreciate all these good questions. Uh, there's a fun one about clergy couples. Callie, that's uh, we we're here at a seminary, so we see a lot of people meeting and <laughs> getting married in seminary. All these clergy couples. Any advice for clergy couples, Callie? Yes. Well, it um, it it actually depends whether they are serving the same congregation or whether they're serving different congregations. So, uh, in this program, it is technically the congregation uh, and the con that applies for the grant, and the congregation can apply. Um, on behalf of any ordained clergy person serving in a pastoral role for them. So if you have uh, clergy spouses who are uh, serving the same congregation, um, then the congregation can apply um, on behalf of both of them at once, uh, or the congregation can apply on behalf of one of that clergy couple and then the, uh, the clergy person whose name is on the application can involve the spouse um, as the spouse in as much of the leave as they want to. Uh, now, if the clergy couple, these are two people actually serving different congregations, that's a different matter because uh, that means that each congregation would need to apply separately. Uh, so um, in, in your case, then you would have each congregation applying on behalf of their pastor and proposing uh, a set of activities and proposing a budget uh, that ideally could happen and stand on its own, um, you know, even if the spouse's congregation doesn't have a grant funded that year. Uh, if this congregation's grant is funded, uh, then they would still be able to do the entirety of their activities. I don't know if I said that in a way that makes sense, but ho hopefully each application would be able to stand alone, is my point. Excellent. Yeah. And we realize there are lots of different configurations of um, clergy couples in terms of how they're splitting the ministry, how many congregations are involved. As with so much, if you have specific questions about that, feel free to email us and describe your particular situation and we'll, um, we'll work with you on a good way forward. I saw a very good question about productivity. Uh, are things designed are these leaves designed to have the pastor produce something or come back with something? And I really appreciate the question, um, you know, teaching in an academic setting as a professor, if I go on sabbatical, then I need to come back and I need to be holding some kind of tangible thing that I can show <laughs> the board of the seminary saying, oh yes, while I was away on leave, I wrote this book or I wrote these chapters or I learned this language or something. That is not quite how we think about activities during these leaves. 
And now it is the case that if it's going to be renewing for you, if it's going to be revitalizing for you to go and write some things, um, study some things, pick up a new skill, then you're welcome to do that. But the distinction that I would like you to keep in your thinking, and it's one that we do talk to the readers about, is the difference between joy and obligation. And the reason why that distinction is so important is that the exact same activity done by the exact same people can either be done out of a sense of joy or out of a sense of obligation. So for instance, if um, I remember a pastor, um, Callie, you'll appreciate this. He was a total John Wesley nerd, loved everything John Wesley, served, at, served in a Methodist context. And he was proposing going over to England and various places and studying the life of John Wesley, reading all these Wesley books, and then writing several um, quasi-popular but quasi-scholarly pieces about John Wesley. I can tell you that the readers looked at that and their question was, is this going to be joyful for this pastor? Is this going to be revitalizing for this pastor? Or is the pastor working in a frame saying, well, if I'm going to get this money and I'm going to get this time off, I, I better come back with something to show for it. And the exact same activity, if it had been the case that the readers had discerned, oh, he's just doing this because he thinks he has to. Um, he's just doing this because he thinks he needs to come back with some stuff on Wesley in order to justify this leave. Um, that would not have been attractive to the readers. As I recall, this pastor made a very convincing case that he, in fact, was a total Wesley nerd and that this was truly joyful, <laughs> joy inspiring for him. So I, I, I think it was OK. But again, when you when you think about what to do and you think about whether or not something is going to be produced, think in terms of the question, is this going to be revitalizing? Is this going to be re-energizing? Or is this being done out of a sense of obligation? Another good example of that would be pastors who want to go and listen to lots of preaching. They want to travel around the country and experience different preaching, different worship. Now, that activity can be very joyful and re-energizing, among other things, because many pastors spend Sunday after Sunday preaching themselves that they don't get as many opportunities to hear the word preached to them or the, or they're so often in charge of worship that they don't get the chance to really just sit and relax and enjoy good worship. So if that's the frame, then that's great. If, however, the frame is, oh, I need to go around and I need to sit and listen to these famous good preachers in order to improve my own preaching because it's deficient somehow, or, oh, my congregation's really trying to think through, you know, different worship styles and I need to go on a study tour to get lots of ideas for the congregation, then the readers will um, perhaps have some concerns about that, maybe perhaps being done out of a sense of joy or uh, out of a sense of obligation rather than a sense of joy. So um, do you need to produce something? If it brings you joy, yes. If it's done out of obligation, then no. The, the thing that you really should focus on producing is a rested and revitalized self for ministry. Callie, what other questions have you noticed? I've seen some questions about, uh, I guess, some who kinds of questions. So, uh, for instance, what about um, what about pastors who are near retirement age? Um, now, we, so we don't have uh, specific requirements about what stage of ministry a pastor needs to be in. Uh, we do have a requirement that when applying, the pastor and the congregation need to attest to their intention. Uh, that the pastor will stay in ministry with that congregation uh, for a year following return from the leave. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we don't have specific requirements. So if, if a pastor is nearing retirement age, but, but would still be at the congregation for at least a year after returning from their leave time, uh, then they're war warmly encouraged to be part of an application. Uh, we've, we've awarded grants to pastors who were in that later stage of ministry, thinking about uh, ending well, thinking about their legacy. Uh, and, and we've also awarded grants to, to people who had just concluded uh, the first maybe 
five or six years of ministry and who were were wanting to pause and to to dip back into some sort of inspiration or to retool in some sort of way. So um, it, it really is for any number of stages in ministry. Um, I've also seen some questions about um, who applies? Is it the congregational representative or the pastor or who should be a good congregational representative? Um, it, it is technically the congregation that applies for these grants. Now, the the um, ideally, it's not an application coming from one person. Ideally, uh, it's a collaboration between the pastor and other uh, leadership within the congregation, a, a team working on the application. Your designated congregational representative can be uh, anyone within your congregation uh, that would be appropriately understood as a contact person for this grant. Uh, it should not, the congregational representative should not be uh, another pastor or a, another staff person on the church. This sh should be a, a lay person in a different kind of leadership. Excellent. So that's one thing I saw. So I saw a question that uh, I think we knew would come up, uh, taxes, tax implications. Uh, and and here we have a very simple answer to a very complicated question. And the simple answer is talk to a trusted professional. Uh, find someone that you trust who has competency in this area. Receive that advice. And then if you receive the advice that there is going to be a personal tax liability to the pastor as a result of the congregation receiving these funds, then you are welcome to designate that amount as part of the $50,000 as a tax offset. Why do we say that? Why can't we give um, just sort of blanket tax advice? Uh, taxes are remarkably complicated. Clergy taxes are complicated. Congregational taxes are complicated. State to state, the situation is different. Uh, your own personal financial situation and all the different variables that impact that. Um, what the only responsible thing we can urge you to do is to talk to someone in your orbit who has knowledge of the situation, make sure that that person understands, as Callie just said, that the congregation is the grantee that we, that should, that when we write out the check, we write it out to the congregation and not the pastor, get the best advice you can. And then again, if that advice is oh, the pastor is going to be on the hook for a certain additional tax liability because of these grant funds, you may write that amount in as an offset. And in the application, you'll just tell us, um, I, talked, I talked to a professional, they said it's going to have this kind of implication, I'm writing in this amount as an offset. You may receive another kind of advice, you may receive the advice that there's no implication Again, in, in any individual pastor's tax situation, there's so many variables that professionals need to track that our, um, our strong urging is to talk to a tax professional and make sure that you have that advice going into the grant period. Another question about money that's come up is how to estimate what things are going to cost, especially since you're estimating things like travel costs a year or more out. It's a very good question. What we want you to demonstrate that you've done in the application is that you've you've done some homework around the costs. You've looked at travel sites, maybe talked to um, a travel professional, talked to others that have done the activity and gotten advice. And then since you're budgeting a few years out, you're welcome to give yourself a little bit of cushion, say around 10%. So in other words, say you're flying to Denmark, and if you were going to fly to Denmark tomorrow, it would cost X amount. You're free in the application to put X plus 10% to account for possible rises. Should it be the case that the grant is awarded and something radical changes, and I think this is especially relevant in a time of COVID and pandemic, right? Um, should it be the case that things radically change cost-wise? If you're awarded the grant, then all you do is you talk to us and say, hey, this situation has arisen. The costs are going to be a little different than I thought. Mm -hmm. And we will work together to come up with a plan that will still get at the same goals. So 
the two, so the two takeaways from what I've just said are do some research, but also don't stress too much if there are changes, um, whether that's related to, um, you know, I think we, I think we certainly hope that um we'll see the end of pandemic related disruption sooner rather than later but we can't know that if there are disruptions related to pandemic if there are um, costs that change radically if you have the grants in hand we will work with you to make sure that we still reach a good outcome callie do you notice other questions i believe you're muted callie yeah I am muted. Thank you. I'm Thanks. unmuted now. Um, I did see some questions about uh, what, how exactly to uh, craft the budget. So, for instance, uh, in this grant application, is it okay to uh, propose a renewal plan that will cost more than the fifty thousand dollars of the grant? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Um, as you're crafting that application in the specific budget worksheets, we'll ask you to only include. Uh, the, the funding as you see grant funding being spent. So the budget worksheets shouldn't add up to more than the $50,000 grant. Um, but in your budget narrative and in, in your proposal narratives, you're welcome to describe a more, an even more robust um, plan. And in your budget narrative, you can just explain which parts of your renewal proposal uh, you plan to have the grant funds cover and which parts you'll be covering from some other source. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna say on that topic, a lot of times people ask, you know, how much, um, how much detail do you need in your budget narratives or how much should we give you? Um, and, and on that topic, I would just say, give us, give us whatever level of detail that you have uh, to show what, uh, to show how you came up with the figures that you're putting in your budget worksheets. Um, so, you know, the more research you can do about what specifically your plans will cost, um, whether it's a particular activity or a particular city where you'll be staying, the more you can show that uh, how you arrived at those particular figures, the, the stronger the, the budget narrative uh, and the application will be, so. Ali, is it an automatic advantage to ask for less money as opposed to more to propose a cheaper renewal leave as opposed to a more expensive one? No, it's not. <laughs> we, we definitely want to see you asking for um, whatever amount up to that $50,000, whatever amount it will take to do what you're proposing to do. And, and we're going to be fully prepared to uh, award up to $50,000 to each uh, application that we fund. Part of the reason why we really urge you to do um, to do that research is that it's often the case, as many of you know, that um, especially things like international tra travel and so on, there are hidden costs there, and there are and things are often more expensive than you might anticipate. So, the more research you can do, the more you can know again how to build in that cushion for yourself so that you're not caught unawares, especially once travel has commenced, you don't want to be beyond the way and somehow really run into a financial difficulty. So preparation there can be very important. Yeah. I'm looking through um, the, uh, I'm seeing a number of very good questions about you know senior pastor versus associate pastors and so on. Uh, from our perspective, any ordained pastor who is on the roles of the congregation is welcome to apply. So for instance, if you're a pastor in a multi-staff setting and your primary obligation is music or youth ministry, as long as you are ordained within your denomination and as long as you are on the pastoral role of a congregation, you are welcome to apply. And I think, um, I think we could say confidently that from our perspective, there's no preference for senior pastors as opposed to associate pastors or anything like that. It's, it really is the strength of the application. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I'm seeing a number of good questions about uh, when you say bring friends and loved ones along, who do we have in mind? Well, you're maybe sensing a pattern here. Our question to you is, who do you have in mind? <laughs> uh, who is it that you would want to bring along that would really um, 
that if you're the pastor, you would benefit from having them in this orbit. Um, many pastors who are married or partnered, uh, they will often want to bring their spouse or partner along. Uh, many pastors want to bring their children along, perhaps for all of the leave, perhaps for just portions of it. In other words, there can be that differentiation too, where some of the leave time is spent with family, in which case grant funds are, can certainly be used to cover their costs as well. It's very common for pastors to also designate part of the time sort of alone for various reasons. That's also fine. Uh, what if you're a single pastor? Well, uh, we have a number of folks who say, I want to bring these dear friends along. I want to bring these seminary classmates along. I want to bring this mentor of mine along for part of the leave. All of that is fine. The one um, asterisk I would put on that, and this is an area where there's some gray to it rather than an absolute, be careful about a situation, even if it's a pastor who has friends who are members of the congregation. The problem with bringing along members of the congregation is that the congregation tends to come with them, <laughs> as it were. In other words, even if you have a very good friendship outside of the congregational context, if a past, one of the goals of these leaves, and something that is actually remarkably hard to achieve, and I'm guessing that many people listening can understand what I mean by this, it can be hard for pastors to not wake up in the morning and have the first thing they're thinking about be their congregation. Pastors love their congregations. They care for them. They're, they're wired to always be thinking about something related to the congregation. Hear me when I say it is to everyone's benefit, especially the congregations, if the pastor can have a time of relative separation from the congregation, precisely to renew and revitalize herself as a person, as a child of God, and so on, so that when the pastor and the congregation come back together, it's on the basis of that renewed energy. So the more the pastor can truly be away from the congregation, the better the ultimate outcome will be. Because again, those of you listening who are involved in congregational life, you know, it, it's awfully hard to just stick a toe into the congregation. Um, I saw a question, do, do pastors ever attend their own congregations while they're on leave? that's awfully tricky because if you're a pastor, you know that if you open just one email or if you take just one phone call or you have just one conversation, that's, um, you, th you thought you were sticking your toe in, but all of a sudden you're back in the pond. Um, and that's, and, and again, that stems from the very good fact that pastors and congregations truly love each other and pastors are wired to serve. So we, we and the readers will be fairly insistent that there is as much separation between the pastor and the congregation as possible. And that means that if you're planning for one of these leave periods, you should think in terms of coverage, even for emergency situations. Now, obviously things come up. It may, there are cases where leaves have to, time away has to be cut short for various reasons. But as far as the emergencies that you can plan for, if that's not an oxymoron, but um, I mean things like funerals, I mean things like um, even key members passing away, I mean things like um, weddings, you know, all of, all of these various functions, uh, readers will want to see that the congregation is committed and the pastor is committed to maintaining as much as possible this separation, even if um, those kinds of regular events in the life of a, of a parish come up. So if, if you're a parish and you're not ready to give that commitment or you're a pastor and you're not ready to give that commitment, you'll want to do some discernment as to whether this is really the right time for this leave opportunity. Callie, what other questions are we seeing? I've seen a couple questions about pastors serving um, a two-point charge or pastors serving multiple congregations uh, and how to do that application. So um, the in that case, only one of a pastor's congregations should apply. Um, and so the, the application 
and the details would be coming from that one congregation and they would be the, the fiscal agents of the grant if it were received. Uh, but in the, in the proposal narratives that you're writing and, and in the budget narrative where you're talking about funding details, those are the places where you can break down the situation of, well, here are the two congregations that the pastor is serving. And even though this one congregation is the one applying, here's how we're planning to share the funding or share the arrangements and the details. So uh, an application should come from one congregation, even in the situation where a pastor is serving multiple contexts. Um, and then to, to flip that question, I've, I've also seen the question of, we have several pastors on our staff at the congregation. Can we apply to send several of them on a grant renewal leave at the same time? Uh, the answer is no, unless, unless it's a clergy couple, if there are spouses both serving the same congregation. Uh, in that case, the, the two pastors could be involved in one grant. Uh, but in the case of a congregation with multiple pastors on staff, uh, the congregation should only apply on behalf of one at a time. Um, if a congregation does receive a grant to send one of their pastors on renewal time, uh, then once that pastor gets back, uh, then three years after that, the congregation would be eligible to submit another application on behalf of a different pastor, if that makes sense. I'm seeing a I'm seeing a question as to what about after the leave? What is required? Is there um, is there a report? Do you account for the funds? The um, that raises a broader question as to how the funds are actually distributed, and this is an instance where we really recognize the congregations have very different practices as far as how they handle money and what the structures are. So should the grant be awarded, as I said, the check is mailed to the congregation. At that point, the congregation and the pastor decide what is the best mechanism for the funds actually being handled and dispersed. And whatever practices a congregation has in place, we trust that those will be followed. At the end of the leave then, the pastor and the congregation do two things. One, they submit a fairly short uh, report answering some questions, mainly along the lines of how did it go? Uh, what, what were the benefits? Anything you would have changed? Those sorts of things. And then you give a financial accounting. You do not have to turn in your receipts to us. It may be that you need to track receipts for within the congregation, but you don't need to re return receipts to us. What you do need to return is a financial form saying, here's what we budgeted, here's what we spent, here is any leftover, if there is some leftover. And then that needs to be signed not only by the pastor, but by um, an authorized congregational representative, usually the treasurer, if, uh, if there is such a position in the congregation. And once we receive that, the, the grant is closed successfully. So I say that not only to um, reassure you that the back end process is not particularly onerous, but also um, to reinforce that we really do trust local knowledge and local practices when it comes to these things. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions around, does one have to be the pastor of a congregation since it's the congregation that applies? What about uh, hospital chaplains? What about university chaplains? It is the case that this program is for congregations specifically. Uh, some of our other partners within the Lilly Endowment Ecology, including the Louisville Institute, uh, which you can look up at louisvilleinstitute.org, will occasionally have sabbatical opportunities for other for pastors serving in other settings or like judicatories, that sort of thing. But for these specific programs, they are centered on congregations specifically. While we're on the money questions, I'm seeing a couple of other good logistical questions. Um, one has to do is what if the congregation is awarded a grant, but then the pastor leaves prior to uh, fulfilling the grants? The, uh, the grant is received by the congregation, but it's received on the basis of these activities being pursued by the pastor and the congregation together. So if um, the pastor discerns a call to leave the congregation prior to expending the grant funds, then the grant funds do need to be returned to us. Um, and 
they, they'll just then be cycled out to another congregation. The silver lining then is that both the pastor and the congregation then become immediately eligible to reapply in the, in the future. I'm also seeing a question related to uh, something we have in our request for proposals, which is that we ask the pastor and the, to certify their intent to remain in the congregation for at least a year following the end of the leave period. And the question is, well, what if, what if something happens and um, the pastor discerns to leave or needs to leave sooner than that? Or in the case of say um, our Methodist friends or our Roman Catholic friends where the pastor doesn't always control <laughs> where, where they're sent, what about those cases? The reason for that line being in there is because we really do see these, the part of the purpose of these grants is strengthening in the pastor, the pastor and the congregation for shared ministry together in the future. And so we want the pastor to certify their intent to say, not only is this going to renew me for ministry in the long term, but I'm really excited about it renewing me for ministry in this particular congregational context, at least for the near future. That said, we're aware that we um, we serve a God with a sense of humor. We um, life, life things come up, opportunities come up. Um, if if something were to happen to where that obligation is not fulfillable, or if it's not in the best interests of the congregation, of the pastor, of the ministry, for um, the pastor to remain for that period of time, that's when you reach out to us again. We have a conversation and we think through. Um, yeah, we, we hear from you, um, your discernment, and we go from there. So so take that line in the spirit in which it's intended to really signify a, an enthusiasm for shared ministry together, not as an absolute legalistic uh, prohibition. What else is popping up in the chat, Kelly? See, I, I am uh, seeing some, some more um, budget questions. Uh, I know we've said that the uh, there's a maximum on what the congregation's portion of the budget can be, which is 15,000 of the larger 50,000, but there's actually not a maximum on the pastor's side of the budget, um, as in the pastor's side of the budget could be the full 50,000 um, if, if the congregation doesn't uh, discern any particular budget needs that they want to ask for as part of the grant. So the, the congregation's limit is 15,000, but the pastor's budget expenses worksheet can exceed the $35,000, um, if that makes sense. Um, and then I, I'm seeing another question about um, how the congregational funds can be used as far as like the honoraria and the payment for leadership expenses. Um, some interim or outside leadership can be brought in and paid for using those funds. Uh, but those, those funds for the congregational expenses could also be used to give uh, honoraria or stipends to existing staff uh, and leadership who are taking on more responsibility while the pastor is on leave. So that can be handled in any number of ways, whatever makes sense for the congregation. Excellent. I'm seeing some other questions about activities. One is, um, what if it's a situation where a pastor is pursuing, say, a doctor of ministry degree? Can these funds be used for that purpose? It's specified in the RFP that that is not a primary purpose for which we envision these funds. Um, it's the, um, there are other kinds of grants that are available out there to support doctoral study. We really, again, want to focus in on renewal, revitalization. We certainly understand that learning can be a part of that. And if you're doing doctor of ministry research in an area that's very thrilling to you, and you want to do some things sort of around that area, there may be some possibilities, but you should not think of these grants first and foremost as, say, a means of paying demon tuition or paying travel costs related to the demon. Um, that will be something that readers will be concerned about. And another question raises a very good point. We're 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 here talking a lot about travel, about these sort of large scale exotic adventures. But what about someone who just wants to stay home and write? What about someone who just wants to decompress and sort of be in the, um, be in their side room, 
uh, working on a book or praying, that is also totally fine. The only, um, the only piece I would add to that is that along with, along the lines of what we were saying about wanting to see congregations and pastors committing themselves to separation during this time, if you are spending a significant amount of time at home during the leave, that is totally fine. But just to make sure that it's not a situation where the congregation is going to, um, or the pastor for that matter, where they're regularly going to be interacting with each other in a professional context. If it's a small town and you run into each other at the grocery store, that's just fine. But just make sure it's a situation where that separation is maintained with integrity. And again, in your application, you'll have ample opportunity, both on the pastoral side and the congregational side, to talk about how um, that beneficial separation can be maintained. On the question of separation, pastors will often ask, well, can I... Um, can I write emails to say how it's going? What about social media? If I do a, if I do a Facebook post and somebody from my congregation likes it, have I broken a rule? Um, we live in a wild, ever-changing age of how we communicate with each other. And we certainly recognize that in these programs. So a distinction that I would offer would be between um, activity, communication that happens in real time versus communication that happens in a more relaxed fashion. Um, and in, that's another way to think about the joy versus obligation piece too. So for instance, a pastor who says, well, if I'm traveling to all these cool places or I'm doing all these great things, I'm going to put it up on my social media and my congregation members are my, are my Facebook friends or my Instagram contacts. And so if they, if they like the picture, that's totally fine. But that's a very different case than if the pastor says, oh, well, once a month, I'm going to zoom into worship and give people an update in real time on Sunday morning. Then that's a situation where the pastor all of a sudden has put her, her pastor hat back on, as it were, and that separation has been breached perhaps in unhelpful ways. So again, you can be thinking about what is communication that is low stress, that keeps that separation intact as opposed to modes of communication that sort of continually draw the pastor back into congregational responsibility even um, while the pastor is away and just know that the readers are going to operate with that distinction too i'm also seeing a question about well what if i have a love for teaching or what if i have a love for mission work and i want to do some of that during my leave while I'm away from my congregation? The answer to that is that is absolutely fine. And in fact, warmly encouraged if that's what makes your heart sing. What you'll want to think about is doing that in a mode in which you are not there acting as the pastor of the congregation. So in other words, uh, and we see a number of applications where this becomes a tricky thing. If you say want to go build for Habitat for Humanity or work for a relief agency, that's totally fine as long as you're not there sort of on the clock as the pastor of your congregation. However, if you if say your congregation is sponsoring a mission somewhere and you say, oh, I want to go visit that mission, the, that sounds good, except chances are while you're over there, you'll be there functioning as the pastor of your congregation in a sort of official capacity with that mission partner. And that can blur the lines unhelpfully between uh, separation and not. So think very carefully. It's fine to do ministry work on your leave, but think about it in terms of, am I doing that ministry work sort of as a, as myself, as a person, or am I doing it as the authorized formal representative of my congregation? And if it's the latter, then be, that becomes, um, concerning. Callie, what else are we seeing in the, in the questions? I'm seeing some questions about the congregational activities. Um, for instance, could the money for the congregation's expenses be used in uh, community service? Um, yes, that's the kind of thing like, I don't know, community service projects that the congregation is doing or um, different ways to connect with the community. We 
um, we tend to ask that the congregation's expenses budget not be used to um, supplement or to support existing programs, ministries that the congregation is already doing. Uh, but if this is a, a new ministry or a new, um, new experience or kind of service that the congregation would like to begin during the grant program, uh, then certainly. Um, I'm also seeing the question as to whether the congregation's uh, activities funded by the grant can happen while the pastor is there. Um, and yes, they can. It, it can be flexible when the congregation's grant funded activities are happening. Uh, some of them can happen while the pastor is away on leave time, um, but they can also happen uh, in between the pastor's leave time or after the pastor has gotten back, There would, if there's still time for that. So that can be flexible when the congregation plans their activities. I don't know if you have any more to say about uh, congregational activities. I think that's I think that's very helpful, and um, and again, especially during this um, pandemic time and coming out of the pandemic, just um, we're aware that congregations and pastors are in all sorts of um, timelines are very uh, fluid in terms of what happens when. What we would encourage on that note is that as you are putting your application together we would encourage you to put it together in sort of a best case scenario as if we are fully past the disruptions caused by the pandemic. In other words, write your application as if COVID doesn't exist in terms of how it might disrupt your activities. If the time comes and we are still um, dealing with disruptions caused by the pandemic. As I said, we will work with you around that, but don't let COVID be a hindrance to your imagination. I think that's, I think that's the main thing I wanna stress. Don't write an application saying, oh, well, I would love to do this, but I'm just not sure with COVID, so I'm going to do this other more modest, less joyful thing. No, write, write it up as the most joyful possibility. And if when the time comes, there needs to be an adaptation, we will make that. Um, I'm seeing a good logistical question about, we're saying ordained pastors. What if you are in a denomination that doesn't formally ordain? Or, uh, the, the answer to that is talk to us. Uh, we'll ask you, well, how do you recognize pastoral status? What is the, um, I hate to say equivalent to ordination, but what is a cognate to ordination within your context? And if you and if it's a pastor that meets that, chances are that's going to be eligible. But if you're in a denomination that doesn't use the framework of ordination, talk to us and we'll um, we'll discern the best way forward on that front. So I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing a number of questions, and I know some people have to go. Is this recording going to be available? Uh, yes, we uh, we do plan to make the recording of this session available on our website, so um, you don't have to worry about uh, taking furious notes. I should have mentioned that earlier. I guess <laughs> you, know, you don't have to worry about taking furious notes or or retaining everything. Uh, it'll be available on the site, and we warmly encourage you to share it with others who who might find it helpful. Yes. And I, I can also tell we're not going to be able to get to every single question that's been submitted in the Q&A. So uh, please feel free, um, however specific the question may be, please feel free to follow up with us by email, uh, clergyrenewal at cts.edu. Um, and we'll be happy to, to address some of your specific questions if we haven't been able to get to them uh, in the Q&A during this session. Excellent. Yeah, I'm seeing, um, we've talked a little bit about what not to do on the congregational end, but I'm seeing some good questions. What have congregations done? I've given some, we've given some examples of um, what pastors have done. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it to you in a second, Callie. Um, one, some activities that I've seen congregations do very beneficially would be activities that cause them to think about their um, their past and their history. In other words, oftentimes, as we've said, pastors will sort of retrace either their ancestors' steps or their own steps, reflecting on where God has brought them on the journey. I've seen congregations creatively do the same thing. I've seen scrapbooking projects. I've seen quilting projects. I've seen photo um, archiving projects. I've seen celebrations around, um, including historical celebrations around that. So that's one. 
Um, as I said, I've also seen um, congregations, if they have, say, like a favorite author or a, or a subject that they really want to go deeper into, with that $15,000, many congregations are able to pay someone to come in for, a, for an evening, for a weekend or so on, and, and lead the congregation in that. Um, I've, seen, I've seen congregations do all congregational readings. You know, let's all um, let's all read a C.S. Lewis book together or a book on anti-racism together. Um, those are some things that stand out to me. Callie, any any other things you could think of with congregations? You know, I I remember congregations doing um, doing art projects together, um, art installations, uh, sharing artwork, creating uh, exhibits that they you know, in their church building that they're opening up to the community. Uh, I've heard of congregations um, sharing their testimonies, gathering their stories, creating books and videos and ways to share uh, either community stories or congregational history stories. Um, and, you know, in some cases, the, these kinds of activities are paralleling the kinds of themes that the pastor is exploring. But in other cases, uh, what the themes that are renewing to the pastor aren't necessarily the themes that that really struck a chord for the congregation. So the congregation was pursuing different themes that that was were really speaking to them for their activities. So so there can be some dovetailing of themes, but not necessarily. I think uh, one of the very important things in every angle of this application is is in your proposal narrative. Just be sure to explain to the readers why what you're proposing is the right thing for the people involved. That's that's where your story uh, and your passion will really come through. So, yeah, there's a lot a lot to work with there. As, as Callie mentioned, we may not be able to get to all of the questions, but you're welcome to email us again at clergyrenewal at cts.edu. Um, I'll say you can also email me directly. Um, uh, my, you see my name, Robert Saylor. My email is rsaylor at cts.edu. Um, but um, I'm seeing some questions around, uh, is it possible to submit a draft for early feedback? The answer is because of the number of applications we get, uh, we're not able to offer comments on full drafts. However, if you have a specific question that you'd like to ask, like, hey, what about this wording? Or um, would this kind of expense be okay? Or is this kind of activity all right? You're welcome to uh, ask us specific questions and we're happy to weigh in on those things. Um, also seeing some questions about um, time frame as far as when the money is available. So we've said that um, the funding for this current application cycle is for uh, renewal leaves beginning in 2023. So the, the proposed activities themselves would have to begin in 2023. Um, but practically speaking, the since the announcements of the award decisions are made by the end of August, 2022. Uh, the actual disbursement of the grant funds, it will go to the congregations in the last couple months of uh, 2022. So if you're looking at a renewal program that's beginning say in January and February of 2023, uh, you could think about having the grant funds available um, in the, the last couple months of the year to begin making um, making arrangements and making down payments and airfare, purchasing airfare and such for early 2023. Uh, but again, the, the grant funds um, would not be allowed to cover anything, any activity that happens prior to 2023. I want to, we're coming towards the end of our time and uh, I want to answer one more question that, uh, was was helpfully framed as a negative. I want to see if I can do the negative and then also the positive. The question was, what's the biggest mistake a pastor can make during this process? And I want to answer that and then try to say what the opposite of that would be. Um, a couple of things. One, as we've already said, one big mistake would be um, copying something or trying to guess, oh, this is what the readers want. This is what the program wants us to do rather than asking the question, what is going to be most beneficial for me? Um, over and over again, I've heard pastors say, 
oh, well, it's weird that I didn't get funded because I did the exact same thing as this other person that got funded. And chances are, if the frame was, oh, I'm, I'm trying to guess what they want rather than explore and dream and discern what I want, uh, that, that will come through. The positive to that really is, again, readers are looking for that passion, looking for that heart, looking for um, that particularity. Um, all of us are unique as God's children and whatever God has, however God has wired you to be renewed, <laughs> both as a pastor and a congregation, go with that. Um, another major mistake that a, an application can make again is the pastor sort of working in isolation from the congregation in the sense of just doing this whole process and then only bringing the congregation in sort of to get permission to do it. Um, a much better way to approach it is to start to dream together between the pastor and the congregation and think through what this experience will look like holistically and why it will benefit both the pastor and the congregation. If it's approached in that shared spirit, um, not only is that a much more joyous process, but it's one that's um, going to lead to a much stronger application. Callie, as we wrap up, I wonder if you want to say a word about some of the resources that we have available on our website, what people can find there? Sure. So the, the link that we have shared um, as part of your reminder emails about this webinar, uh, that will take you to a page that has uh, some basics on it. It will have the request for proposals documents uh, for the, the two programs, the Indiana program and the national program. Uh, right underneath those, it'll have some uh, fillable forms, so you can actually uh, download those fillable PDFs and type into them from your computer. Um, it also has some informational videos. They're very short, but they're um, sort of FAQ and introductory videos that can be shared um, maybe at the beginning of a meeting or at the beginning of a brainstorming session. Um, at the bottom of that webpage, there are also some handouts uh, that, that are very helpful. Uh, they're called Grace Notes and How to Craft a High Quality Proposal. And those are just some suggestions and reflections on uh, how to put together your proposals and how to, how to think about this process. Um, I would also say that on our home landing page, uh, there's a, a new podcast series, which is a series of interviews with uh, pastors who have participated in this grant program in the past. And so it, it can, even though uh, we don't actually share what past proposals have looked like, uh, listening to that podcast series is a great way to hear from people who have done this. What were some of the things that they did and what were some of the things that they tried and how did those go? So those can all be helpful. Um, and we also have some book recommendations as well. If you would like some books to um, read about the concept of sabbatical and to, to share with, um, with the rest of your congregation. Excellent. And, and I believe this came up earlier, but we also have Spanish speaking, uh, Spanish language resources on the site, including an application in Spanish. And if you are a Spanish speaker, we have uh, staff available if you have questions related to the programs and, we, and you would like to um, write to us or call us in Spanish language, we'll, um, we will um, have those questions answered as well. I wanna thank you for all of your questions. Again, we're aware we didn't get to all of them, but um, feel free, if we didn't answer your question, feel free to write us. And um, we're very eager to talk with you. I wanna end somewhat in the way that I began, but it's very much on my heart these days. Anytime I'm talking to people who do ministry, whether that's pastors, whether that's congregation members, um, ministry of all kinds, I want to express my gratitude, our gratitude to you for the way in which you are um, faithfully, determinatively, creatively keeping the faith during these times. Um, these, are, um, these are intense days on a variety of fronts. I, I believe that the spirit is moving in very powerful ways, but we are also intimately aware on our end of just how um, demanding ministry is in times like these. So um, the fact that not only are you um, continuing to pursue that ministry, but that you're open to discerning a call to 
bless your pastor, bless the congregation by means of a program like this. Um, we are we are very grateful for that as well, and certainly don't take it for granted. So we want to say thank you. We want to say God bless you, and we very much look forward to hearing from you. Yes. Please take care. Yes.